Hello, you're watching Sunday Night's Press Preview. It's our first look at what is on the front pages as they come into us here at Sky. And tonight, we'll take a look at the headlines with the barrister and former government minister, Anna Subri, and political editor of the HuffPost UK, Kevin Schofield. Great to have you both in the studio yeah, tonight. Yeah. We shall chat in a moment after we've had a look at those front pages for you. The resignation of Nadine Dorries leads the eye, which says her parting shots at the Conservative leadership have put a number of Cabinet members at risk of losing their seats at the next election. Tomorrow's Telegraph says the Home Secretary wants police in to investigate every reported case of theft rather than ignore so-called low-level crime. The Guardian says health experts are worried that ultra-processed foods are causing what they call a tidal wave of harm, including high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes as well. And, in fact, it's the same story in tomorrow's Mirror, which headlines it The Great British Food Scandal. The Mail leads with claims that NHS hospitals are increasingly moving to drop the terms mother and woman under pressure from trans rights groups. Here's tomorrow's FT saying major companies in the West are worried that the sluggish economy in China will soon start to have a detrimental effect on global trade. While the star says temperatures on Bank Holiday Monday will hit 23 degrees Celsius. A sunny Bank Holiday, who'd have thought? And don't forget, you can scan the QR code that you see on screen during the programme. Check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers uh, while you watch us discussing them. And to do that, political editor of the HuffPost UK, Kevin Schofield, and barrister and former government minister, of course, Anna Subri. So, let's get cracking. Uh, lots in the papers. Anna, uh, front page of the I, uh, the headline, Tory big beasts facing wipeouts at next election. Uh, Nadine Doris resigned yesterday. She's been uh, talking today on uh, TV. What did you make of that resignation letter? I didn't read it. You've not read it? No. <laughs> I mean, I've read of it, obviously, in the papers. You chose but... not to read it? No. Why? I think she's... Um... Well, no, I'm not going to say what I think about Nadine Doris, but I'm delighted that she has finally resigned. And I should imagine her constituents are even more delighted that they finally stand the chance of getting an MP who's actually going to work for them. But, I mean, she continues to do huge damage to the Conservative Party. I mean, like, this is a gift for Labour. I mean, to have somebody, whether you like her or not, I think she's pretty terrible, but of her stature, though, who is commanding, as we are doing, talking about her, to say that the Conservatives will not, cannot win the next election, blaming it all on Sunak, and then you get this in the eye where they are rightly saying, well, it's a new split, and that's right, she's opening it up, she's putting loads of salt into that wound. They go on to say that prominent Cabinet members like Penny Morden, Grant Shapps and Mark Harper face losing their seats. Yeah, what I, I'm not make... sure about all of that, but... Right. Yeah. There, is, there is a possibility, yeah. obviously, that some big names will go mm. when the next general election is... When it's yeah, and, 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 uh, we'll, get, we'll get your thoughts in a second, Kevin, but I'm just interested to know, Anna, what, what you make of her comments where she, she, she wouldn't say that she'd vote Conservatives in, in the next election and says that the Conservatives can't win under Sunak. Yeah. So, I mean, how damaging is that? for a party less than 18 months before they've got to hold a general election. Because the one thing we know, we know a number of things, but it's the absolute sort of maxim that is completely true, that the British people, well, any electorate, don't like split parties. And the more this infighting goes on, the smaller and smaller the chances Can, can the Tories win the next election? I hope not, because I believe we need to change. They've got to go, and I want to see Keir Starmer as our next Prime Minister. Will you vote for them? I, well, where I live, I live in a very safe Conservative seat, and I will vote for whoever, even though I like my MP very much, Ed Arger at Charlwood, um, but I will vote for whichever party I think stands the greatest chance of, unfortunately, him losing his seat. Fascinating. And I think lots of other people will vote in a way to, tactically that we've never seen before. Yeah. What do, what do you make of it all, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, I think... Anna makes a good point there. I think you get the sense... I mean, the, the, the other line here is that they've got a poll in the eye which shows that Labour are still 15 points ahead of the Conservatives. That's actually at the lower end at the moment. A lot of polls are putting them 20 points in front. You know, um, it's, we're coming up to almost a year since Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister. The polls haven't shifted at all. Mm. And I think people are now... It's almost the settled will... Um, of the country that it's time for a change and that, you know, 13 or 14 years come the next election of the one government is probably enough. Um, I don't think people are 100% convinced by the Labour Party or Keir Starmer, but I think the country, it looks as though 
from all the polling focus groups, people that you speak to, I think they've come to the conclusion that it's time for a change. And things like this, as Anna says, this constant infighting, chaos, uh, backbiting, splits, people are just sick of it. And what what do you think will happen with the by-election? I mean, do you, it's a huge majority, isn't it? Nearly 25,000, I think. It would be, yeah, it would be enormous for Labour to win that. Um, that would be the biggest ever majority that they've um, uh, overtaken. Um, I think it would be interesting to see how Labour and the Lib Dems play it, though, because the Lib Dems fancy it as yeah, well. They do. They're, they're the bookies' favourites mm. um, as well. So um, and there's their a possibility is local. there. Yep. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, you're right. The candidate is local, and I know they're going hard on Labour's candidate for not being local. He's from there, but he's, but he's a councillor in London, London and exactly. that just will not, I think, wash, given what they've put up with under under Dorries, you see, I think they'll go for a local person. Yeah, and given the size of the majority, I guess there is a chance that Labour and Lib, uh, the Lib Dems could split the anti-Tory vote. Yeah, because they've said there won't be a pact Tories in. again. Well, Lib but Dems it's the that every time. And see, people forget that voters are not the same as the people that are in charge of a political party, because you know, most people do not belong to a political party. Mm. And I think they will work it out like they did. I mean, goodness me, I never thought that, the, that Labour would win in Selby. And Anstey. Yeah. I mean, that was an extraordinary, that was an extraordinary. victory. That, that so, was. who knows? It was but... almost overshadowed that night because they didn't win exactly in Uxbridge. Exactly, in Uxbridge. Yeah. Um, it was and an extraordinary overreacted victory. to that, I yeah. think, Labour. But, but on, on this one, yeah, I mean, I think no one is seriously talking now about it. They've got a good Tory Conservative, winning. strong Conservative candidate. Mm -hmm. He yeah. is local, he's known, he's the, the PCC. Mm. Uh, so... all, the, all the ingredients are there for the Tories losing the seat. You know, not, not there must be so much anger in, in the constituency at. Nadine Doris, and by extension, the Conservative Party. Yeah, we've been, we've been up there today and we've heard, yes, a, bit, heard a bit of that anger. Yeah. Um, let's move on to the FT. Um, Kevin, uh, China's sluggish economy will weigh on global trade. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the global economy relies so heavily and has for a long time now on, on China's economic growth. They make a lot of stuff, they buy a lot of stuff, and um, any downturn in the Chinese economy is going to be bad news for the rest of the world, not least the UK. Um, where Rishi Sunak has made one of his five pledges to grow the economy, and this is not welcome news. I mean, the, the figures in China, obviously, in comparison to the UK, are still pretty impressive. They're actually bringing interest rates down to try and boost spending um, by Chinese people. It's not worked. Uh, gross domestic product was 0.8% up in three months to June, but that's down from 2.2% uh, just um, the previous 12 months. So it's... Clearly, there's a slowdown in China, and as I say, that is bad news for the rest of us. It's going to take us a long time to get over what COVID did. And China suffered like everyone suffered. But, I mean, probably particularly so because they put down such restrictions effectively on trade because they wouldn't let people in, they wouldn't let people out to do trade and to do business. And all the supply chains got busted up and broken up again because of COVID. And it just shows you the, the harm it did, but it is bad news for our economy. Um, and it will be for others because they are the second biggest economy in the world and if they're in trouble, mm. that has a knock-on effect. Of course, yeah. Um, let's, uh, just for the break, let's talk about uh, Prigozhin, uh, front page of The Guardian, uh, Moscow confirming that they've done DNA tests uh, and he indeed was on that plane. Um, will, will this stop the conspiracy theories, do you think? Okay. Can, we, can we believe this, Anna? Look, whether he was on the plane or not, one thing's for sure, he was going to be dead. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the awful... The point of it all is that Putin has done what he was always looked set to do, which was to get his revenge on somebody who dared to stand up to him. I mean, he's a pretty ghastly character, but, I mean, Putin, you know, he's, he's almost unstoppable, it would seem, and he will truck no opposition. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's not a surprise we more or less knew that Prigozhin had been on the plane and he died, but you're right, conspiracy theories, if one thing that most recent as has taught us, there will always be conspiracy theories. I mean, some people think Elvis is still alive, you know what I mean? There's, there will always be... You mean he isn't? <laughs> well... We can talk about that later, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, you know, there will always be conspiracy theories, but I think it's a nailed on certainty that, as you yeah. say, Anna, Putin got his revenge yeah. and, um, yeah. I mean, someone wonder why it took so long. Anyone, anyone swallows 
the idea that it was an accident. No. no. And putting on the TV crocodile tears, saying how he talks with the family. But, but, he, but, but I mean, he, 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 Putin could have done this in a much more subtle way, couldn't he? And yet he chose to do it in a very public, exactly. very obvious way. Yeah. It was a clear sort of A clear sign. message. Yeah. Um, do you think that is a sign of somebody who um, is actually on the back foot a bit, someone who's desperate? Is that the case? Or Because he could have, he could, he could have got rid of um, Prigozhin in, in many other ways. Well, yeah, I mean, well, a, a lot of his enemies tend to fall out of... Uh, high windows, yeah. uh, so this is a, a new Poisoned. one. But yeah, it was it's sending a message, and yeah, I guess you could argue that it shows that he's not, you know, if you're having to rule, he is ruling by fear. He's certainly not ruling by consent of uh, the Russian public, who obviously um, are able to access information one way or another on the war in Ukraine, how badly it's going for Russia. Um, but yeah, no, it doesn't send out a message of strength, I don't think. No, where Although do you it think it does show that he can get rid of anyone who I stands in his way right now. It's surprising, though, that he didn't take his revenge considerably sooner, because he was oh, he's going off to Belarus, and everybody thought, <laughs> yeah, not for very long. Mm. So it's taken him long enough. I mean, goodness knows what the real story is all about that. But... Mm. Where do you think this leaves um, uh, the elites in Russia, those who have become uh, nervous and concerned about the regime? Because uh, they've got a decision to make now, haven't they? On the one hand, they see what happens to those who dissent, but on the other hand, they know that if they're going to move, they need to move decisively, and you can't falter halfway. It's all or nothing. Absolutely. I, mean, I, I genuinely don't know how it will play out. I mean, I think it's going to be one of those that, until he actually dies... I can't see anybody ever standing up to him. And unfortunately, the Russian people don't either seem willing or don't have the ability to, because they're so downtrodden and, and fearful. Yeah. So that's the state that they live under. So it's very interesting. They won't rear, rear, rear up either. No. I even though their men are getting slaughtered in Ukraine. Yeah. I'm, in fact, I made a note of it because it was very interesting. The poll in the Sunday Times today uh, suggesting that after the plane crash, only 8% of Russians believed that Putin was responsible. Well, there you go. I mean, I mean, I think it shows you what a tight grip he's got on the information and yeah. media in Russia. Um, I mean, that day was a remarkable day, if, if you remember. And Pr Prigozhin came very close. The Wagner group came remarkably close to actually um, marching on Moscow. Mm. And it was only at, at the last minute, really, that mm. this deal seemed to be done. Obviously, we know that hasn't, um, Putin hasn't kept up his end of the bargain. But, uh, but yeah, it does show that Putin is vulnerable. But you're right, it requires someone or um, a group of people to really go for it. Because if they shoot and miss, then he will take his revenge. Yeah, yeah as we have seen. OK, thank you both uh, for the moment. We're going to head to a break. Coming up, we'll be having a look at more front pages, including the Telegraph, illegal migrants to be electronically tagged. Talking about that and more in a couple of minutes. Hello again, welcome back. Part two of the press preview. Anna and Kevin are still here. Kevin, why don't you kick off uh, uh, part two? Uh, this story on the front of The Guardian, uh, covered in quite a few of the papers, actually. Ultra-processed food uh, is doing us a huge amount of damage. Yeah, I mean, we knew that ultra-processed foods, or UPF, um, was bad for us, but this really kind of brings it into stark relief, really raises the risk of high, high blood pressure, heart disease, heart attacks and strokes, which is, you know... Scary enough. Now, this is food like cereals, protein bars, fizzy drinks, ready meals, fast food. But what I found quite incredible was that well over half the average diet in the UK and US now consists of ultra-processed food, mm. um, which is obviously storing up massive health problems for the future. The NHS is already under massive strain. Uh, this isn't going to make things any easier. In fact, it's going to make it a whole lot worse. But this is something we talked about this earlier. This is something that governments have been aware of for a long time, and yet there doesn't seem to have been much done to try and improve. There have been, there's been campaigns, but you know it doesn't seem to have kind of followed through. Preventative sort of education and that sort yeah. of thing. I mean, do you feel this government does enough? Well, when I was a health minister, I was the minister for public health. I mean, this is, if I may say, stating the bleed and obvious because we've known this for a very long mm. time. And so, when I was in the Department of Health, there was this complete conflict within government be between this sort of ev hard evidence and, of course, as, it's, as it says in The Guardian, 
especially people who are, following on from what you've just said, f people who are younger, poorer, or from disadvantaged areas. We yeah. know about health inequalities. This is all part and parcel of all of that, with the attendant pressures on the NHS. And yet there's a reluctance in governments, and it, not just, you can't just say it's the Conservative government since 2010, the previous governments as yeah. well. But there's this conflict between, look, this is unacceptable, this is wrong, you can't just keep giving people education programmes, because actually mm. the evidence is it doesn't really work. You as governments, like we did with the sugar tax, have to take measures to help people really get on top of this. And then you get the pull on the other side, which is, well, hang on a moment, food manufacturers, just like the old tobacco companies, the argument when mm. they employ a lot of people, they bring a get lot a of, of revenue tax, in. Yeah. And then on top of that, you get the right-wing ideology, which has grown in the Tory party, which is, well, hang on, we don't believe in the nanny, nanny state, state yeah. you see. So let people make their own... So what choices. is the answer? Oh, you have to get tough on this. Right. And you have to start controlling what people put in food that is aimed at people who don't have very much money. Mm. And that's what you have to do. Right, and you have to of, yeah, take out yeah. this rubbish. But there's a price to be paid because we know that it's cheaper food. And so that means that food will go up for a lot of people who are already struggling. That's why they buy this cheap food, yeah. because they don't have much money. Of course. Yeah, it's depressing, so it's, isn't it? It's yeah. really difficult. Yeah. Um, let's move on to a story. It's on the front of the Daily Telegraph, but also the Times as well. Uh, Kevin, electronic tagging plans to stop migrants from fleeing. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's remarkable. Obviously, they're just throwing ideas out now. Anything at all to see if something sticks when it comes to immigration. You know, the, the, the government is failing in all its targets to stop the boats, to reduce the asylum backlog. Now they're talking about putting tags on um, migrants because there isn't enough space in the uh, asylum detention system. But, you know, where do the people go? Who has to monitor? Do they have the staff in order to monitor it? I mean, they tried the baby Stockholm as well as another, as another wheeze. Um, that hasn't ended particularly well because of the Legionella um, that was discovered in the water supply. You know, there was a daft idea a few weeks ago of sending um, illegal immigrants to Ascension Island, which was very quickly stamped down on by uh, Number 10. It just feels as though the government is flailing around. But know, many people will say, won't they, that um, actually we don't know where a lot of no. these migrants go because they're put in a hotel or whatever, and then they do disappear. They do disappear. I mean, so I've represented people. Some who... people will say this is a good idea. Well, it's, <laughs> but it's meaningless rubbish, this. I mean, it's pretty shameful that great papers like The Times and others actually are buying this line from the government, putting it on their front pages, when this is absolute twaddle. Who's going to put a monitor on in the first... Who, and you're going to, it's going to cost money to buy the GPS systems and put the tag on people. Who's then going to police it? If people take the tag off, and it, it is possible, it's quite easy to take a tag off, or you, you breach the conditions of the tag, who's going to police all of that? Also, the cost of it as well. The cost? But mm. who are the people? We can't... The biggest problem we have at the moment is actually this appalling backlog that is actually growing, despite all the promises, not diminishing. If you're going to put your assets anywhere, it's, a, it's looking at that backlog and then, of course, all the other things which we should be doing, which is safe and legal routes mm. and actually having a compassionate system and recognising the benefits of, of immigration. But in any event, this is just a headline. And it, it's really, you know, it's not fair on, on, frankly, your viewers because they will think that this is possible. It's not possible. It won't do the job. And it is right. People are just walking out of hotels. I mean, I've represented a number of um, migrants in, uh, since I've been back at the bar, and it is extraordinary the tales that they tell. Mm. They, they can just co go, or they mm. go, from hotels. A lot of them because they actually want to work. They want to do something, not just sit around receiving £47 a week, whatever it is, though they're grateful for that, they want actually to contribute and do something yeah. as they wait, you know, up to years in some cases it's, for their claim to be dealt with. It seems very bureaucratic as well and, I mean, very difficult to police, I think, but they're talking about um, the people with... If, if it was ever to happen, which I doubt, but if, it was, if they were given the tag, they'd be required to report via text or in person to immigration officers multiple times a day. I mean, that's by so text. Who's yeah. impractical? Yeah. Who's paying the phone bills? I mean, um, yeah, it's uh, as you say, it's covered uh, covered extensively in quite a few of the papers. You can yeah. read more about that uh, in the Times and Telegraph as well. And um, thank you both. For